I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Priya Rastogi. Uh, we are thrilled that she has agreed to conduct this webinar in clinical on clinical trials. She's an outstanding physician and researcher, and some of you may know her because Dr. Rastogi has frequently participated and workshops and led workshops at the Pennsylvania Breast Cancer Coalition uh, Conference. Uh, Dr. Rastogi is board certified in internal medicine and medical oncology, and she specializes in the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of breast cancer at McGee Women's Hospital of the Pe uh, University of Pennsylvania Medi uh, Pen Pittsburgh Medical Center. Dr. Rastogi also serves as a Senior Associate Medical Director and Vice Chair for Medical Affairs with the NSABP, which is the National Surgical Breast and Bowel uh, Project, really the foremost uh, clinical trial uh, program uh, in breast cancer. And she has, is the Protocol Officer for Phase 2 and Phase 3 Adjuvant and Neo adjuvant breast cancer clinical trials with that group. Conducting her own research with the NSABP, Dr. Rastogi examines the risk of congestive heart failure in women who receive drug, the drug Herceptin in combination with chemotherapy. We are thrilled and honored to have her with us this evening. Uh, please welcome Dr. Priya Rastogi. Thank you, Pat. It's, it's an honor to be here tonight, and I'm really happy to um, have a lot of discussion as we go through these trials and that we get through all the questions that come um, through the chat. So we're going to talk about clinical trials in breast cancer. So next slide. So this is um, what we'll go through tonight. We'll first talk about clinical trials in immunotherapy, which is a very exciting time right now. These, um, the immunotherapy has made breakthroughs in other very hard to treat cancers such as melanoma and lung cancer, and now are making headway with clinical trials within breast cancer. We'll also talk about clinical trials with other agents with carboplatin and PARP inhibitors, and then also for ER positive breast cancer, some of the clinical trials with CDK4-6 inhibitors. So first we'll start with the immunotherapy, and this is basically what's called the cancer immuno, immunity, immunity cycle. And what you see here is with cells, whether there's normal cells or cancer cells, you see um, the release of, when chemotherapy is given, especially with a cancer cell, you see this release of the cancer cell antigen, where you have all this antigen-presenting cells, and where the T cells, which is the patient's own immune system, really to start to fight the cancer. And what is being utilized in clinical trials in breast cancer, as well as other cancers, is trying to sort out how can we make the patient's own immune system be more effective in terms of killing the cancer and having improved outcomes. So next slide. So here you can see all the agents that are being developed to help make a patient's own immune system um, work to more effectively in terms of killing the cancer. And what we're going to focus on tonight is on um, number seven, where it's the PD and PDL1 inhibitors. <clears throat> What essentially they do is they take the breaks off the immune system. So here, here's the hypothesis, which is the next slide, in which what happens is the local immune system has partial control of the cancer. And we've seen this in studies which have me measured what are called tumor lymphocyte counts. What's been seen in these studies where in the tumor you have these a lot of lymphocytes that there's better overall survival, um, these patients have better outcomes. But the process is not as, as efficient as we would like it to be. And so what the hope is with these immune checkpoints or what are called PD L1 checkpoint inhibitors, it will increase the efficiency of the immune system. And so as we're talking about, it's basically taking the body's own T cells, 
taking the breaks off the T cells so they can attack the cancer more effectively. Next slide. And so this is what you'll see here, where you have at the top, the tumor cell, at the bottom, the T cell. And so this PD-1 is expressed primarily on the activated T cell, which is at the bottom. And what happens is that PD itself basically is a break on the T cell. It doesn't want the T cell to work too hard in terms of making the immune system too overactive. But what have been developed are these PDL1 inhibitors, which attach to the PD, and then what happens, it then lets the T cell become more active, essentially. Um, it lets them just be more effective in terms of killing the cancer. Next slide. So this pembrolizumab is just one of the PD, PD-L1 inhibitors. Um, most of the companies, the big companies like Genentech or in this case Merck, have these PD or PD-L1 antibodies. They all are, seem to be effective. And so they are, in terms of like with Pembro, it's basically a pl blockade of the PD-L1 and PD-L2, as we were talking about, that it hits that receptor. <clears throat> And with Pembro, it's demonstrated clinical activity in multiple tumor types. And we've seen this with our other agents like Pembro. So the other agent we'll be talking about tonight is atezolizumab, which is the PDL1 inhibitor made by Genentech. So Pembro has been approved in the US for different tumor types, as well as atezolizumab. Next slide. So this is one study that had reported previously. This was called Keynote 12. This was for patients with triple negative breast cancer who were, had received a lot of treatments. So these patients with either recurrent or metastatic triple, triple negative breast cancer received Pembro single agent every two weeks. Next slide. This is what we saw with toxicity with this study. So some arthralgias, fatigue, some uh, muscle, like joint pain, joint pain type of things, um, and some nausea. The other um, side effect that, that you have to watch for with these PDL or PD1 inhibitors, it's rare, but you do have to watch for autoimmune type effects. So um, sometimes you'll see hypothyroidism or very rarely colitis. Um, so things that just work through the immune system and that um, you have to be watchful for in terms of rare side effects. Next slide. So in this study where there were approximately 30 patients, the overall response rate was about 20% and the stable disease rate was 25%. So these results were very exciting because again, this is triple negative breast cancer advanced stage where patients had received multiple lines of treatment. So not only were they seeing um, a higher overall response, but also stable disease. Next slide. And so this is um, what's called a spider plot where each patient is represented. It just gives you a flavor of the where you see the dotted line, patients below that line or right around that line were having the responses or the stable disease. So it gives you a flavor of how these patients were responding at each time point where they were having their scans performed. Next slide. Now, the, this, um, these PD-L1 or PD inhibitors have moved from um, treatment of um, metastatic disease where it's like third or fourth line more into first, the first line setting. So there's two studies ongoing right now. There are phase three studies, first line metastatic triple negative breast cancer. One study is using a tezolizumab. So again, that's Genentech's PD-L1 inhibitor. So it's a tezolizumab with nabapaclitaxel versus placebo with nabapaclitaxel. Again, in uh, metastatic breast cancer, it's about 900 patients, and both PFS, or uh, progression-free survival, and overall survival are being evaluated. The second study, which again is in metastatic triple negative breast cancer, is evaluating Pembro plus chemo versus placebo plus chemo in previously untreated, locally recurrent, inoperable metastatic triple negative breast cancer. And that's also around 900 patients. So these are both studies that are ongoing in triple negative breast cancer for second line treatments. Next slide. 
Now, this is a study that NSABP slash NRG is conducting in collaboration with SWOG. SWOG is the lead group with the study, but the NRG um, NSABP leadership were also involved with the development. It's basically, as you see, as these agents, the PD, PD-1 inhibitors are being utilized in the metastatic setting, they're being moved up to earlier stages. So in this case, this phase three study is evaluating PEMBRO as adjuvant therapy for triple negative breast cancer after patients have received neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So at patients have had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, have had their surgery, and at the time of surgery, in the path, they have residual disease. So these patients either have residual invasive cancer or a positive lymph node. After neoadjuvant chemotherapy, they'd be eligible for this trial. Next slide. What we know with triple negative breast cancer that these patients, so again, after they've had neoadjuvant chemotherapy, have surgery, are NED, but within the pathology that they have residual disease when the pathologist is looking under the microscope, those patients have not as good of outcomes in terms of disease-free survival or overall survival if they don't achieve a PCR. And this was seen um, with NSABP studies, but also other studies have also shown this. And so we're really looking for novel ways to treat these patients to make the uh, disease-free survival and overall survival better. Next slide. And so this was an, another study, this was done by the uh, German group, GBG, that again showed just what we talked about, that patients who do achieve a PCR after uh, being treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy for triple negative breast cancer have really good outcomes, but patients who do not have a PCR don't have as good of outcomes. And one area of um, research is just looking at how can we make those outcomes much better. Next slide. And so again, this is a study we were talking about, uh, which is a collaboration with NRG and SWOG. <clears throat> So patients with triple negative breast cancer who have greater than a centimeter of residual cancer or are lymph node positive, again, after receiving neoadjuvant chemotherapy, have had surgery, and then the randomization is either to PEMBRO or observation. So this study is currently open through the NCTN, so um, any sites who participate in the cooperative group or NCI trials um, would, could open this study. And it's just started recruiting, so there's a lot of a way to go with it. The primary objective is disease free survival. Next slide. And then this just shows you the sample size calculation. So the accrual period is thought to be about 3.5 years with an additional follow-up of four years. And so the sample size for this study is about 1,000 patients. And so it's currently um, enrolling. It's early on in the study. So this study will be open for a while. Next slide. Now we're going to talk about HER2 positive breast cancer and immunotherapy in, in that setting. We're, um, I'm gonna go through the background and then we're really excited about this study. This is a study that is uh, being led by NSABP NRG and should open probably about the spring or summer of um, this coming year. <clears throat> But essentially, we know from Cleopatra, so Cleopatra was for HER2 positive metastatic breast cancer. These patients were randomized to docetaxel with Herceptin or docetaxel with Herceptin and pertuzumab. And as many of you know, this has now become standard of care based on this study for first-line metastatic breast cancer. Next slide. So the results from this study uh, was that there was an improvement in progression-free survival with the addition of pertuzumab. So the chemo with trastuzumab and pertuzumab, or the other two words for that are Herceptin and Progetta, there was an improvement in PFS compared to chemo with just Herceptin. Next slide. There was also an improvement in overall survival, um, which was great to see, uh, basically from 40 months to, to 56.5 months. Next slide. Now, another study that was published in uh, the JCO showed that a similar regimen, so instead of docetaxel, but paclitaxel, the sister drug, 
with trastuzumab and pertuzumab had a very similar outcome in terms of progression-free survival. And so with this regimen, again, it's very similar to Cleopatra, but a little less toxicity with the paclitaxel with the trastuzumab and pertuzumab compared to the docetaxel. Next slide. And so other areas of research and what we've been working on with uh, our operations center is that what we're finding, and, and we've known, that Herceptin or Trastuzumab also works through the immune system. So both through this innate and adaptive mechanism for immunity. So we know that patients, some patients with advanced age breast cancer, HER2 positive, will do very, very well just with treatment with the chemotherapy and trastuzumab. Next slide. And so again, we come back to our cancer immunity cycle. And what we'll show, next slide. One more slide, thank you. So what happens is that chemotherapy works at step one, where you have the release of the cancer cell antigens. So they're out there. Then you have where also trastuzumab and pertuzumab work at this space. Next slide. And as you keep coming around the circle, what you'll see here is that as you're getting these T cells activated with the chemo, the Herceptin, the Progetta, and then potentially what we're going to be studying is if you add in this PDL1 inhibitor, and Medi4736 is just one um, that's made by AstraZeneca, if you add that into this combination, are you going to make outcomes even better for first line metastatic breast cancer? Next slide. There is some preclinical data that shows that when you add to Herceptin an anti pdl one antibody, that there's a lot of synergy and it helps suppress the tumor in the in mice models. Next slide. And so this is the study that um, we ha is, we have an approved concept through CTEP, and we have a fairly advanced protocol, and we'll be launching, as I said, next spring. <clears throat> So this study, again, is for HER2-positive, first-line metastatic breast cancer, and patients will be randomized to weekly paclitaxel with trastuzumab or pertuzumab, which is essentially standard of care right now, or that same combination with a pdl one inhibitor for two years. And so, again, we're just very excited about this study, um, and it'll be opening this spring. Next slide. This is the eligibility criteria. So again, for HER2 positive breast cancer, patients must have measurable or non-measurable disease. They may have received neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemo with HER2 targeted therapy in early stage breast cancer. And then uh, staging scans are needed as well as a check of the ejection fraction by an echocardiogram or, or MUGA. This is for, for in the first line setting, so no chemotherapy would be allowed uh, prior to starting the patient on this study for metastatic disease. Next slide. And these are the endpoints. So the primary endpoint is progression-free survival, but we'll also be looking at overall survival and then also looking at toxicities. Next slide. And so um, these are the statistical assumptions. So we're really hoping to improve progression-free survival. And our sample size is 480 patients. The monthly accrual, we hope, will be about 30 patients per month. And again, this will be open through the NCTN. Next slide. Okay, so now this study was pr reported pr uh, previously. This is called the iSPY2 trial. And in the study, what they looked at was essentially paclitaxel followed by AC. So that was the chemotherapy background, backbone. This was in the neoadjuvant setting. What they were looking at is adding Pembro to paclitaxel. So what they found, next slide, that patients who had triple negative breast cancer, the PCR rate improved from 20% to 60%. <clears throat> so uh, a big improvement in the pathological complete response rate. 
interestingly, they also saw for hormone receptor positive HER2 negative breast cancer, where typically you don't see a very high PCR rate with chemotherapy. And so you see here in the control, um, that was 13%. This was improved to 34% with the chemotherapy and the Pembro. So these are two areas that will also be studied, you know, with these PDL1 agents. One study that will be launching um, I guess next month, I was going to say later this year because we've been working on it over the last few months, but um, essentially is what will be called NSABP B59. And this is a study for early stage patients in the neoadjuvant setting, and it'll be looking at a TASO with chemotherapy um, for patients who are either node positive or high risk node negative. And again, we're very excited to be launching that trial um, at the end of this year. <clears throat> That one will be through the NSABP Foundation. So if um, there's interest, um, please just let us know. That won't be through the um, NCTN mechanism. Now we're gonna talk about uh, carboplatin. <clears throat> So as we've talked a little bit about, triple negative breast cancer can be more aggressive than other subtypes of breast cancer. There have not been agents that have been approved more recently in triple negative breast, breast cancer specifically. What we have seen, and we'll go through some of this data, is that patients who receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy who where there's carbo has been added, there have been higher PCR rates in the triple negative patient population. Next slide. So this is one study, CALGB40603. It was a two by two randomization. The chemotherapy backbone was paclitaxel followed by AC. And then what the study looked at was either adding BEV or CARBO or both the CARBO and BEV. But we're, what we're gonna focus on is the chemo backbone compared to when CARBO was added. Next slide. What they saw in this study for the patients who received the anthracycline taxanes, that the PCR, so again, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the pathological complete response rate was 46%, and it was increased to 60% with the addition of CARBO. Other studies have reported very similar outcomes. There was a GBG study that also showed this improvement by about 15 to 20%. Next slide. Brightness, which was a collaboration um, with AVI, which is a company with um, NSABP Foundation and uh, GBG, which is a German breast group. This um, study looked at Viliparib, which is a PARP inhibitor, with Carbo and Paclitaxel. The second arm was Carbo with Paclitaxel, and the third arm was Paclitaxel, and then all patients went on to receive AC. What was shown when this was presented at ASCO, next slide, is that the patient who received the CARBO, and this is, the, I'm looking at the upper left uh, graph. So what you'll see is the patients who received CARBO had, again, a higher PCR. So the light blue is showing paclitaxel by itself, paclitaxel followed by AC, PCR rate was about 31%. It increased to 57% when CARBO was added. The third group, which was adding the Viliparib, had about the same PCR as the CARBO. So in this case, with Viliparib as a PARP inhibitor, there wasn't an added benefit with Viliparib in this setting. But as you can see, the CARBO showed that there was an improvement in PCR. Next slide. So as we were um, talking about, we've seen these increased PCR rates with different studies with the addition of carboplatin. The one part that we are missing is that we don't know what the impact is on long-term outcomes for disease-free survival and overall survival. Many of these studies were not powered to look at these long-term outcomes, so they didn't have a large enough sample size to look at that. So um, next slide. The study that we have ongoing right now through NRG is what's called NRG BR003. And this is for patients, so this is in the adjuvant setting. Patients who are either node positive or high risk node negative with triple negative breast cancer are randomized to dose dense AC followed by weekly paclitaxel or the same regimen with the addition of carboplatin. 
in this study, we picked the every three week carbo. We've been asked, could you have gone with the weekly or the every three week? But just with within protocol development, the decision was made in this case to go with the every three week carbo with an AUC of five, which is a little bit. Um, some of the states have used an AUC of six and have seen more toxicity, and so that's why we went with an AUC of five in this study. This is currently recruiting. We're at about 30% of target accrual and would love to see um, an increase in this. We know many sites are giving neoadjuvant chemotherapy in this setting, but there are still uh, patients who are being found in the adjuvant setting to either have triple negative or more disease than was thought. And so this would be the trial for them to really look at the long-term outcomes for the addition of carbo to traditional chemotherapy. Next slide. These are the eligibility criteria. So if a patient is node negative, the primary tumor must be greater than three centimeters. And then patients who are node positive are eligible. The triple negative definition is based on the ASCO CAP guidelines. So ERPR negative with the IHC less than 1% and then HER2 negative based on ASCO CAP. The couple questions we've gotten about this trial is that um, sites would like us to use a lower size for the primary tumor. Um, we've had discussions previously, and just the way this trial was set up in terms of the sample size of 990, we had to match the same event rate as we'd see with the node positive. So that's why we had to use the three centimeters instead of the two centimeters. The other question, and we are going to be able to do an amendment to incorporate this, the ERPR for the triple negative is the very strict criteria, and CTEP is um, allowing us to include the 1% to 9%. So for patients who've had like one biopsy, which is triple negative, but then they have another biopsy that shows just a tickle of ER being positive, let's say 2%, we will be having an amendment in the next couple months to allow those patients in the study, because I know that's a barrier. Next slide. And these are the endpoints. So again, since it's an adjuvant study, the primary endpoint is invasive disease-free survival. These are the secondary endpoints we'll be looking at. Next slide. And then, as I was saying, that the sample size is 990 patients. We're looking at about a 30% reduction in for the hazard ratio. Next slide. So now we're going to switch over to the PARP inhibitors. And at ASCO, there was some fabulous data that was presented during the plenary session for Elaparib. So this was Olympiad, was the name of the study. <clears throat> and it was for patients who ha had HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer, ER positive, or triple negative. They had to have a BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, and essentially what this study looked at was Elaparib versus chemotherapy of physician's choice, whether it was capecitabine, aribulin, or nabilbine. And um, one of the reasons as we go through these results, what's exciting about this is this is probably the first agent of breast cancer that has gone head to head with chemotherapy and has shown a benefit. A lot of times, chemo is so effective that it's difficult to try to beat that in these clinical trials. <clears throat> Next slide. Oh, we can skip this. So Next slide. So in this uh, study, the median age was 44 to 45. About 57 to 53% had BRCA1 mutations, 40% had BRCA2 mutations, and there was also a pretty even split in terms of patients who had ER positive breast cancer versus triple negative breast cancer, so a 50-50 split. Next slide. And what you can see here is the percentage of patients that received prior lines of chemotherapy. So about 33% who this was first line uh, chemo or elaparib, 39% um, who had one, had one other line of chemo, and then about 25 to 28% who had had two lines of chemotherapy for metastatic disease. Next slide. And so this shows you what's called the progression-free survival. And what was shown is that there was an improvement in the progression-free survival. So chemotherapy, it was 4.2 months compared to with Elaparib, 
months. So the hazard was 0.58. So it, it, a, an improvement in PF, PFS for going head to head with chemotherapy. Next slide. The res overall response was also higher with Olaparib compared to chemotherapy. Next slide. And then they looked at different subgroup analysis. Um, the triple negative seemed to have a greater uh, response uh, to this agent, but sometimes you'll see events with ear positive breast cancer later. So it's hard to really make a difference right now, but again, um, very active within this patient population. Next slide. And at this point, there was no change in overall survival, but again, it's early with the reporting of this study. Next slide. And as you would expect, patients who received Olaparib actually um, did better in terms of adverse events than patients who received chemotherapy. So obviously more neutropenia with um, the chemotherapy. Um, what you do see with Olaparib, which we're even following in our early stage breast cancer trial, is you can get some low-grade uh, GI toxicity um, and anemia. Next slide. So this is what's called NSABP uh, B55 or BIG613. It's called Olympia. This is a study that's currently recruiting in early stage breast cancer. So it's a global study. Um, it it's, has a, um, a neat um, setup in terms of, in rest of the world, this study is being conducted with AstraZeneca and with and BIG. And AstraZeneca is basically supporting BIG to be the group involved with the study. In the United States, CTEP is actually supporting this study with additional funding from AstraZeneca. So um, it's, a, it's a really neat model in terms of the study in rest of the world is being funded through a company, but in the United States, it's being done through the NCI with, with support from AZ. So with this study, patients with BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutations are eligible. Patients can have received neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy, and um, the randomization is to either Laparib or placebo for one year. So you can see here to the left, these are the high-risk groups. So in the bottom part for the adjuvant setting, so patients after they've received adjuvant chemotherapy, for triple negative breast cancer, if they're node positive or node negative with a primary tumor greater than two centimeters, those patients are eligible. Or for patients who is ER positive with greater than four nodes in the adjuvant setting, those patients would be eligible. In the top box, for patients who've received neoadjuvant chemotherapy with residual disease, for TNBC, any residual invasive disease in the breast or nodes, um, the patient would be eligible, or for ER positive breast cancer, patients who have a CPS EG score greater than or equal to three are eligible. So this is a very exciting trial. The total sample size is 1,500 patients, and um, it should be finished recruiting sometime next summer. So um, again, we're very excited about this trial and really um, hope that um, within the United States, we continue to have a robust re recruitment to this trial. Next slide. These are the eligibility criteria. So as I mentioned, patients must have a germline mutation in BRCA1 or BRCA2. And um, <clears throat> central testing can be done through Myriad. Um, what we've been seeing in the United States, most of these patients, especially in the triple negative setting, are getting tested anyway. But then there's central testing that's required through Myriad as well. Next slide. So with this study, patients must have completed at least six cycles of neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy containing anthracyclines, taxanes, or both. And um, essentially, all the chemotherapy has to be given up front. We have received questions based on the CREATE-X data, which had shown in triple negative breast cancer, patients who had received an anthracycline taxane that after surgery, if they received capecitabine, there may be improved outcomes. Um, this, In this case, with this trial, we um, are not allowing any chemo after surgery, so everything would have to be given up front, including carboplatin. Next slide. 
And this is the statistical plan. As I was mentioning, we uh, would need about 1,500 patients for the total sample size, and um, we're getting close. So this study will close globally next summer. Next slide. Now we're going to move on into the ER positive breast cancer. And so this is a study that is being led by Alliance Foundation, but the other foundations are also participating, including NSABP Foundation. So this is the PALACE study, and what it's evaluating is palbociclib, which is a CD4, CDK4-6 inhibitor. So patients can have received either neoadjuvant or adjuvant systemic therapy, and the randomization is to palbociclib with endocrine treatment or endocrine treatment. The sample size is 4,600, and it's uh, recruiting very well, both within the United States as well as globally. Next slide. The Penelope study is a study that's being led by GBG. NSABP is also participating. And this study is essentially a closing to accrual, but it's a very interesting study design. Uh, patients who received neoadjuvant chemotherapy had surgery with or without radiation were randomized to palbo uh, versus placebo with appropriate endocrine therapy. Um, it was a neoadjuvant study, so patients um, who did not achieve a PCR were eligible. Again, the study accrued fairly well both um, within the United States and Canada and um, basically is close to screening as of this month. Next slide. So as we were talking about with the CDK4-6 inhibitors for hormone receptor positive breast cancer, what happens is you have estrogen that stimulates the expression of cyclin D1 and then facilitates this activation of CDK4 and 6 and works through the cell cycle progression. So what's thought to happen with these CDK4-6 inhibitors is that if you inhibit that cell cycle, it may lead to basically apoptosis um, or senescence of the cancer cell. <clears throat> For abemaciclib, which is another CDK4-6 inhibitor, it has received um, FDA approval, as has palbociclib in metastatic breast cancer. So all these CDK4-6 inhibitors you know, are being studied in the metastatic setting. Some have approval in the metastatic setting, but are now being studied in early stage, as we saw with Pallas and Penelope. Next slide. And so this is just some data with abemaciclib, uh, which is the Lily CDK4-6 inhibitor. <clears throat> this is our Monarch 2 study that patients with hormone receptor positive HER2 negative advanced breast cancer were randomized to abemaciclib with falvastrin or falvastrin. Next slide. <coughs> And what was seen is this improvement in progression-free survival. I just wanted to show you that this is a flavor you'll see with any of these CDK4-6 inhibitors, whether it's palbo or abema. This is an improvement in PFS in either first or second line disease when it is added um, to either an, um, an aromatase inhibitor or to falvastrin. Next slide. And so this is a study that we've also just launched this fall, NSABP B58 for hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, node positive early stage breast cancer. Patients are randomized to endocrine therapy or endocrine therapy with abemaciclib. And so we have sites that are participating in PALACE, which we would want sites to continue to finish out PALACE. That one is occurring very well and should finish sometime next summer. Uh, for sites who are not recruiting to PALACE, we would uh, like sites to um, open NSABP B58 if they're interested, and then um, once Palace closes, those sites could potentially participate in this NSABP Foundation study. Next slide. And so this is the eligibility criteria, very similar to for these adjuvant ER positive breast cancer trials. So hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative, uh, patients must have had definitive surgery. And in this um, setting uh, for the B58, we are looking for a very high risk group. So patients who've had pathological tumor involvement greater than or equal to four lymph nodes, or if there's one to three lymph nodes involved, then there must be one other criteria that's met 
that you see here. So either KI 67 greater than 20% nuclear grade of three or pathological primary tumor size greater than or equal to five centimeters. Next slide. And then as you see here, this just shows different times of like when the patient can come on. So essentially if patients have received neoadjuvant or adjuvant chemotherapy and have had definitive surgery, they can come on after all those um, all those modalities are finished. Um, we talked about the one to three positive nodes and, um, and then about the primary tumor size. Next slide. And so that, um, I'm finished with the presentation, so happy to take questions. Okay, our first question is, you mentioned an early stage breast cancer clinical trial. Are there any more specifics on when that will be available? And where and can I, people find information on that? And I believe, I think this is talking about for the immunotherapy. I think this is probably because the first um, topic we were talking about was the immunotherapy. So if, and just correct me if I'm wrong, but I, if this is talking about um, what we're referring to um, as NSABP B59, this is for um, early stage breast cancer. So in the neoadjuvant setting for triple negative breast cancer, patients would receive chemotherapy with a TASO or a placebo with a TASO. A TASO is given for one year. We're just launching um, that trial now. So it's through the NSABP Foundation. So happy to um, provide more information um, you know, for, for people who are interested. Do you know the status of NSABP FB7 clinical trial? I do not, but I can find that out for, um, if, if um, you send me an email after this, or Stacy, if you're able to send me who is requiring, I can find out the answer for that. Okay, sure, yep. Are you obtaining genetic information or even doing oncotype or mamma print on the patients as well? That's a, a very good question. A lot of these studies have a correlative science worked into the study. So, um, for example, the last study we talked about, B58, um, which is looking at the bemaciclib with endocrine therapy, there are discussions ongoing about potentially looking at some of those, um, as you mentioned, oncotype or one of those uh, those types of studies within it. Um, the grade three for that study was picked just um, to make it a little easier because in some countries, um, oncotype or mammoprint aren't as re readily available. But, um, but studies are looking at that. And most of these studies, which I didn't mention, are collecting tissue um, or may even have an extra biopsy to be able to do correlative science work um, to look at all these very interesting or fascinating things to make the research move forward. 